I have to say this is a special gathering because among other things it is certainly a old home week for many. We have a lot of great special guests in the audience and a lot of great special guests who are coming to talk today. The inspiration of this was several fold, but I do want to give a special shout out to Dan Caruso who underscored, I think after his above net transaction, that the three top fiber companies in terms of providing fiber based service are all Colorado companies. Level three, TW Telecom and Zaire Group. All of which, as things should happen, start from a similar uh, set of inspirations, which was MFS. So today we are going to take a tour through history and there's a lot of great lessons from that history and a lot of interesting questions that are relevant today. We'll have three different keynote addresses, all of whom are leaders in this landscape. Larissa Herta from TW Telecom, a graduate of University of Colorado, could not be here. She, um, however, uh, was so sorry, I wanted to have me pass that uh, on. She would have loved to be here. We do have Tom Ray, graduate of this law school, who is with a company called Corsite, and we'll hear about how that fits in with our fiber infrastructure a little bit later. So the Silicon Flatirons Center <coughs> is getting very close to its uh, 13th anniversary, which means we are almost a teenager. And certainly, we have many uh, fathers who helped us grow up and develop, uh, but none more significant than Dale Hatfield. Um, Dale will be on the panel later. And this topic is one he's been talking to me about for quite some time, and uh, along with Dan, uh, also an inspiration for doing it. Without further ado, we're going to start with our first keynote address, which will lean into our next panel. And want to invite Jim Crow to come join me here. Let's see here. Do well, we don't I'll have one for you, exactly. Here. So pick whatever seat you want. We'll probably need another uh, seat up here to bring the rest of the panel up. So Jim, I've already outlined that you were there at the creation. And I don't know if I asked you this question before, so let me start. How did MFS exactly get founded? Uh, first of all, let me say hello to the many people in here. I have known some for quite a long time. Uh, you said hello to Dale. Dale was around pretty much uh, from the beginning. Uh, I saw Ann Bingaman earlier, we were reminiscing. Anyway, there's Dan Caruso, who worked uh, with me at MFS. Um, a fellow who's not here, uh, Royce Holland, who Dan will remember. Uh, I don't see where Dan is. There's Dan. Quite well, Larissa would remember uh, if she was here. I know Dale Hatfield will remember. Uh, and I were actually together in Omaha, Nebraska, to your, directly to your question. Uh, and uh, we had worked together previously in the competitive energy business, uh, back when you could uh, build a gas turbine for 100 million, buy 1.1 billion bucks worth of natural gas on a fixed contract. You spent a, a billion, uh, on the, on the gas, uh, maybe you sold it for 1.1 billion and pocketed the difference. That math probably didn't work, but you got the idea. Uh, we noticed along the way that uh, we'd show up in the state houses and we were dealing with the same people that an outfit down the street uh, called uh, MCI dealt with at the state level in unregulated communications. And uh, of course, the uh, divestiture was fresh, this is 1985, something like that. Uh, and uh, through a set of odd circumstances, we were approached, literally, by a company that had uh, uh, negotiated the rights, Dan may remember this, called Chicago Fiber Optics. Uh, they had uh, negotiated the rights to use tunnels underneath the streets 
of Chicago, actually tunnels that uh, Al Capone, Capone had used to run illegal alcohol, and had this idea. Uh, those of you who uh, probably aren't all, many, but those of you who, who were around at the time recall that uh, MCI had pried open, much to the chagrin of the FCC and many others, pried open the right to offer a very limited set of interstate services. Well, along the way, uh, they opened up the right uh, to offer interstate point-to-point -point unswitched connections, so just pipes. They had to have them for their own service. I think it was sort of unnoticed at the time that this was something you could uh, actually offer competitively. This company had uh, the idea to fill up these tunnels with, uh, with fiber, connect uh, large corporations to long distance carriers with unswitched connections. We uh, looked at it, and the more we looked, the more interesting it became. Uh, it seemed like a really good idea uh, to, to look more and more and more. We did. At the time, I might add, you could sell a T1, a single unprotected T1 for 1300 bucks a month, so one and a half megabits, so it was hard not to make money at this sort of thing. We, one thing led to another. Uh, to quote uh, Bill McGowan uh, at MCI, uh, actually to steal his line, for many, many years MFS was a law firm, he used to say with a microwave antenna on top, I would say with a little bit of fiber into our offices, but for many years product development, all of what we were about was prying open kind of state by state, the ability to add one more service. And of course, today we take it for granted, but it took a long time and a lot of the talents of people in this room to finally get it done. So I'm going to start with the economic case, because when I taught students telecom before handing over to Preston Patton, who's now teaching our telecom law course, I used what I guess is an apocryphal explanation of the founding of MFS. I said you were a Kiwit before MFS. Is that accurate? Were you That's accurate. accurate. Okay. But I said you guys were provisioning private networks for companies like IBM who didn't want to spend $1,300 a month on a T1. And you guys looked at the math and said, we're in the wrong business. We don't want to just construct these networks for IBM. We want to provision them ourselves. Is that completely made up or is there any truth no, in that? No. That like anything, there's always, uh, it happens, there's multiple explanations. It's rare that there's a single reason or explanations. You're, you're accurate. Uh, um, we were in the business of building networks. We built what became the Sprint network. We built networks for AT&T and others. Along the way, we ended up in a joint venture what was it, with what was called network systems. Now, that, but previously it was Western Electric, then network systems, then Lucent, and now Lucent Alcatel. We offered to build networks for people. In general, these were um, fiber-based networks. That gave us comfort that we could figure out how to build a network. But building a network is not the same as offering a service. Right? Uh, um, offering a service, solving a customer's need, is something else. Uh, the, the reason we, MFS existed, Teleport existed, it was an outfit in uh, in uh, Philadelphia, one in DC, existed is because the bells at the time, the bell, the bell, and then the seven bells sold 1.5 megabits a second, unprotected. So if it went down, you went down. If you had a problem, you were out of out of business. For 1,300 bucks a piece, if you wanted, uh, you said, well, my phone service is really important. Uh, if it goes down, I go down. Uh, you could buy protection, but you had to pay 250 bucks a month for what was called automatic switching protection and buy a whole nother T1. So you add all that up, I, whatever it is, 28, 2900 bucks for a T1. I buy 30 meg from Comcast for whatever it is, 90 bucks a month. This was 
2,800 bucks for a meg and a half. And they wouldn't guarantee you that it wasn't in the same fiber, that is one single connection to the building. So uh, to directly to your question, yeah, we got comfort we could build it, but when you can sell a T1 for 2,800, we originally offered the same service for about 1,200 bucks, gave you two T1s and a automatic switching protection and the margins were 95%. So we, which was good because we, we were so dumb and we so misunderstood what was going on. We needed those kind of, that kind of enormous pricing umbrella. Even that wouldn't have been enough, but fortunate, unfortunately for customers, fortunately for us, at almost the same time, there was a major fire in the Hinsdale central office burned it to the ground and knocked out a good portion of Chicago, which convinced everybody that having an alternative, not having all your eggs in one basket was a good idea. So we happened to be at the right place, at the right time, with a network when, when uh, the need was demonstrated uh, graphically, let's say. So Chicago is your first real market that yeah. you entered into? And was Chicago also an early market for MCI? MCI's original network, as I recall, was Chicago to St. Louis. I think. St. Louis, yeah, for truckers. So, what is it about Chicago that made it so inviting for entrance? Uh, the the Illinois uh, uh, Commerce, Commerce Commission. Commission. Uh, uh, Dale, you'll keep me straight here because uh, he was right. I don't see where Dale is. It's right there. Uh, you recall there were about three or four commissions that always led the way. Uh, Illinois, New York, uh, Massachusetts maybe. Uh, then I'm running out of names pretty fast after that. California? California was late to the party. Once they got going, uh, they were okay, but uh, they were fairly late. They weren't early on right at the cutting edge. You've adverted this, so let me ask the question. Can you expound a little bit on the relative importance of those state commissions and their progressive policies versus what happened on the federal level with the AT&T consent decree and at the FCC and, and how you might look at them in terms of relative importance? And why I'd be there? in the construction business and Dan would still be working for Illinois Bell if that hadn't, if it literally, if it weren't for the, uh, the state commissions. Uh, the FCC, uh, I don't know if you were working for Illinois. You probably were in college back then. No, I worked for Illinois Bell. Yeah. Uh, it, it, you could not have uh, pried open the, the lid without the, uh, the commissions. I, uh, I put it this way. The FCC got pulled along uh, by the commissions, not the reverse. Now, once things got going, and I think once uh, Reed Hunt, they became, what, what, by the way, whether you like Reed Hunt or you dislike him, no one ever said he wouldn't take a position. Uh, he did, and uh, that changed things, moved it kind of to the national level. But prior to that, it was all, a lot of the action was at the, at the states. So during that first decade or so in the 80s, can you remember at what point you thought, we've got a real business here and I think we're going to make it? Uh, well, uh, when, when Bernie Ebers offered uh, $14 billion, that's for MFS, that's when I figured was we were probably okay. Uh, uh, you know, uh, any time, I know people, there are many entrepreneurs here, people who are in the business of funding entrepreneurs, uh, you're always asking yourself, am I going too fast? which means you'll tip over, or am I going too slow, which means you leave a vacuum for someone else. Uh, for many years, uh, you remember the Greek myth of Sisyphus, not to be confused with Sis Sisyphus, not to be confused with Sisyphus, which I have on my mind these days, the committee for... <laughs> Foreign investment in the U.S. Oh, God. Uh, Sounds like it feels like syphilis. Yeah. <laughs> we caught a big dose of it when we bought Global Crossing. But you remember that fellow that rolled the stone up, hit it into the top, it rolled back down, rolled it up. 
That's the way it felt for the first, for almost all of MFS, certainly for the first 10 years of level three. Um, it takes a while in the network business, particularly if you choose as the three companies you mentioned, uh, Zale, level three, T, uh, TW Telcom, to actually compete with the former monopolies, the incumbents, by offering alternative facilities. That is a gigantic flywheel. Uh, developing the capability to, to build as an alternative to the Bells, to develop services. You can't simply be me too, particularly nowadays with IP optical services moving so quickly. The ability to provision services at scale, that's hard work. Those who are in the non, the long distance only business, keep in mind, when they sell to a customer, they call up Verizon or Century or AT&T and say, you remember that circuit that enters that building that you used to use for your own service? I just want you to cross connect that in the central office over to me, because I'm in your central office. When Zayo or TW Telcom or Level 3 sells somebody, trucks have to roll. Uh, you have to put cards in connections. And if you want to do that at scale, millions of dollars a month, that takes a long time to get up and running uh, with any kind of uh, predictability. So one more question that I'll call up our other panelists to, to, to join you, Jim. I've had a discussion with Dale, I don't know if you can answer it, but in those early days when you're getting customers, how would you handicap that it was quality or price that was winning over customers for you from the uh, incumbent bell? 15 to 20 percent discount uh, and point out that if you give us 20, 30 percent, you'll probably get a discount uh, from the incumbent because they have to have a little competition. Why wouldn't you want to have an alternative in the event of a pinch? That was your lead argument, not That was quality. 20 years ago. Okay. We don't, of course, we would, we would talk about quality, but uh, this is back then, not today. Yeah. Today is very different. But back then, uh, the, the old statement, nobody ever got fired by, uh, for picking IBM used to be a saying, uh, obviously, a saying that no longer is relevant. Well, back then that was true uh, in bold type and large font. No one ever got fired for using Illinois Bell or Bell South or Ameritech. And uh, I th these numbers I'm pulling out of the dim, dark past, but as I recall, five, say three to six percent of a customer's operating budget might be for telecommunications. This was before everybody had to have a website and everybody uh, had a server that plugged into the internet. So three to six percent. If it broke, you're out of business. So what do you take? The safe choice, which was the, the organization you'd been buying from for 120 years. You had to provide a low risk alternative to make the switch. So, uh, Ian, I invite you to bring another chair up and our first panel to come on up and join Jim and I. Uh, can you stay for a little while? Right? Hmm? Can you stay for a little while? Can you stay for another hour or so? What's your time here? I'll get up and leave on the camera if you don't mind. I don't mind at all. So, let me introduce those with us. It's um, really an honor. Roger Knoll is one of the economists who is. Uh, very closely monitoring developments at that time. Bob Quinn uh, joined uh, AT&T when it was a competitive long distance company during this period and has now come full circle. Uh, Blair Levin was the chief of staff to the aforementioned Reed Hunt and Chris has Savage has been around here for a very long time. Um, he is a extremely tech savvy lawyer who has represented folks on the competitive side and in this house Dale Hatfield needs no introduction. Um, let me start let me start with the question that Jim's already weighed in on. 
which is when you look back at what the key events were during that time period that began to give rise to competition in local fiber networks, which ones do you look at and say, boy, that was a key turning point? And Dale, you've already been turned to by Jim in the audience, so let me start with you. There's so many different events, but are any of the events when you said, wow, this means we're going to really see competition? Well, uh, I was going to go back a step because uh, uh, one of the things that I, I was involved in a little bit was the definition of lattice. You know, we don't talk about lattice much anymore, but they were really sort of a critical, uh, critical component of this. And the lattice, of course, local access and transport areas were the areas in which the uh, uh, bell companies were going to be confined and they're offered their services and they couldn't go across, the, go, go across the boundary. And the notion, the, the notion was, you know, we, we pretty well established that competition was obviously feasible in, the, in the customer premises equipment. And uh, from a lot of economic studies, we pretty well demonstrated the, you know, competition in the long haul market. But it was this thing in between that, that the access, the exchange and exchange access market that was really, uh, we, uh, we struggled with. And I can remember, you, you kind of wanted them big so there'd be enough traffic for the long distance carriers to have enough volume to achieve economies of scale, but you didn't want them so big that you took an awful lot of potential competitor or, or made it more difficult for a lot of potential competition. So the lot of boundaries were, uh, were one, of, one of the struggles. But, but, but to get to your point, what, what sort of intrigued me is struggling to draw that lot of boundaries right. We were struggling with the same sort of things that we struggle with today in that in that this market is such that the feasibility of, well, let me back up. Those of you who hear me speak, I, I, I'm sort of fascinated with the notions of economies of scale, and sometimes I think we don't pay enough attention to it because it drives a lot of what's going on, going on here. And when we, when we looked at that, at, at, uh, at, at that, at that market, uh, the uh, uh, exchange and exchange uh, access, access market, you know, there's economies of scale in portions of it and not in others, depending upon the volume of traffic where you are, depending on how many hops you have to go if you were doing microwave. And, and moreover, I think uh, uh, Jim can confer, is sometimes you can be on one side of the street and trying to get fiber to the other side of the street, and there's real barriers just getting across from one side of the street, street to the other. But, but the sum, what I'm trying to say is that we began to think about competition being f feasible in that local part, but it wasn't something consistent that you could have everywhere because it depended so much upon how much volume there was to a particular customer location and how far you had to go to get there and then what operational problems you had. So it, 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 I'm not sure I'm making this very, very, very clear, but, but the competition at the time, as I saw it, was going to be pretty, pretty pretty spotty for that, for that reason. Well, you've raised a question that's very interesting and not one I thought a lot about. Roger probably has thought about this. But when the AT&T divestiture was happening, these lattice local access transport areas were being defined and the uh, inter lattice service is what was long distance and um, intra lattice was what the local bells could provide. The idea of having competition in access I thought was something that happened after the fact that people hadn't anticipated. Dale suggests that he may have seen that coming. Roger, did you see that at the time as, as a benefit of the decree, or do you think that was sort of an unintended side effect? It seems to me that it was uncertain. That um, I, First of all, I think it's useful to describe what the Justice Department actually had in mind, uh, which, you know, those of us who talked to them weren't the ones who actually created the model. It was they who created the model. And the model they had in mind was one in which they didn't think local competition would ever happen. Bill Baxter, uh, yeah, in, at, at his festrif when, when, when he retired and just before he died, um, admitted to the belief at the time of the vestiture <coughs> that there would never be any kind of local access competition and that the whole point of divestiture was to make the world safe for the FCC to introduce competition everywhere else. And that it would, that, and he was, a, it was partly because he believed in the natural monopoly argument, the economies of scale being so great that only one firm could ever exist. And it was partly because he believed in the political intransigency 
of uh, state regulatory commissions. Now, Dale mentioned the lattice, and I think one of the most interesting parts of the lattice was the thing that convinced me that the states were not likely to be the problem in the long run was precisely what Jim said. You could look across the spectrum of the states, and in the process of designing the lattice, those states that wanted to have a role had one. And several of them picked a very large number. Good point. Whereas others defined it to be pretty much the whole state <laughs> as a single letter. And, the, and to me, I, unlike Dale, who probably knew how to do it, I had no clue how to break up the, what the optimal way to, to configure the local uh, service areas was. But the fact that there were states out there that had bought on to this to the degree that they were willing to make a very large la number of la lattice suggested to me that there were going to be, there were going to be pro-competitive state regulators out there, and I think that was an essential feature. I think Jim is exactly right, that it, it was a co the combination of federal policy and state policy that allowed this to happen in a few states, and then once it was successful there, it would spread everywhere else for competitive reasons. There's no way California is going to lose the Silicon Valley because it doesn't have lattice. Well, like but, you know, real competitive. Bob, you were at AT&T. When did you join AT&T? So I, I, um, I have a, I have a structured career. I, went, I was there <laughs> for about separating. six years while I was in school, and then I came back in 1993 after graduating from law school, and I had been in practice for about five years. So I, I was there. If you ask me for the date that they think I started, they now think I started in 1987. But it was really, it was really 93. Well, for purposes of, of this question, 87 is a good year to pick. Yeah. Did AT&T think there was going to be competition in the access portion? Because it was Jim Crow at MFS and others, including I think Dale's an advisor to TCG, that entered that market. AT&T stayed more or less to the pure long distance segment, right? They did, you know, so I actually, when I joined in 93, um, the Bell companies were going through their alt-reg cases, and, and we were already, you know, the guy that hired me was a guy in Chicago. I started at AT&T Corp in Chicago. And the guy that hired me had seen that we were creeping more and more into the local part of the business, you know, in terms of we were bypassing the local switches, and we were creeping more and more into the local part of the business. And I think he was someone who I think was one of the first, there was a small group, I think, at AT&T who kind of recognized that that was a possibility. You know, when you talk about AT&T, the, the, the big company, I, I, I don't think there was a focus on that. I, I just, I, I, I don't think that that was the focus of the larger company, but I think there were people within the comp corporation who kind of saw, once we started building bypass facilities to the local infrastructure, I think they saw the possibilities of that. Can I just add a quick... Please, well, please. Well, one of the uh, things I think we're confusing a little bit, there was a distinction between switched access and dedicated to special access. Right. And, and I remember very clearly testifying, oh, this is just... <laughs> this is just this is just private line, you know. It's only ten percent of the total market. It's not. Thank you very be, much, by the way. It's not, gonna, <laughs> it's not going to disrupt. It's not going to disrupt anything right. because it's so. A lot of the focus was on was on the uh, was on special acts. What now, we what call used special to be ninety percent is now one tenth of one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> versus switch that. So so I think people like me, generally speaking, I I, I think felt that the switch part of it probably was going to be a monopoly for quite a while, but there were selected opportunities, as I was trying to say, where you could do extend, because it's interstate, you could go stay interstate and have enough traffic to serve an, a, an IBM building or something with right. enough traffic to make it economic. Well, this is what, this is to, to come back on Jim's point, and the, the role of federal and state regulation relatively is very much in question. When the feds got into it, and I'll come back to Blair in a minute, they did declare the interstate special access in the federal jurisdiction. Yes. So even those states who hadn't been That's progressive, true. like the one Jim talked about, at that point they had to allow competition in. So, so the questions that I was answering earlier kind of surround the, the general topic. Can you start a good business in, a, in competitive telecom? And I'd say if I was 20, I'd be interested in starting again. The larger question about competition is a very different one. Uh, you recall at the time, AT&T 
dumped its local phone business in order to retain uh, Lucent. They thought that I used to, you said we built networks for IBM, we did. I used to sit in a room, there'd be 30 people from AT&T, 30 people from IBM, and three of us. Why? Because they thought IBM was the competitor of the future. Cellular was not, never going to amount to anything other than a buck a minute uh, for very rich people. Uh, and all of the, of the competition was in the technology that the phone companies employed. I'd argue today, just to dump something, we don't have competition today in the sense it was meant back in 85. Yes, you can start a competitive company, but add up all the competitors who've started. They don't amount to the amount of special access that AT&T and Verizon collect in places there's no competition today. Just special access, much less switched access, home provisioning where you know cable came out of nowhere. It isn't the competitors like, like MFS. So in any cosmic sense of the world, we're, we're all betting on the internet, optical technology, IP, Apple, Google, uh, and what's coming for competition, not what's cr been created to compete uh, in a regulatory sense. Well, for those... Just to be controversial. Right, and, and for those who have got some endurance today, we'll get to that um, in our third panel uh, in a couple hours. But let me go back in time uh, to the late 80s, early 90s, as the very emergence of these fiber networks is coming up. Blair, you came with Reed Hunt, and Jim's portrait is broad brush, but um, provocative. Until Reed was the chair, the FCC didn't take competition in special access and these markets seriously. Is that a fair critique of the earlier FCCs? Um, if you want me to criticize the FCCs before Reed Hunt, sure, I'm happy to do it. <laughs> How about after? Um, well, that's a little more complicated. <laughs> I'll do it if you don't want to. <laughs> no, I, 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 I suppose I should answer your initial question by saying obviously the most pivotal moment in all of this was the appointment of a former antitrust lawyer as uh, head of the FCC. Um, um, whether he was appointed because he was a former antitrust lawyer or because he's the only person in history to have gone to high school with the vice president and law school with the president, you know, you can, you, you can argue about cause. I do think it was important, and the point that I would make was that whatever was happening in the 80s, by the early 90s, there was, I think, an emerging consensus uh, that was bipartisan in a way that we no longer see bipartisanship, that we ought to try competition. And Reed at a very early, it was, it was not just Reed, it was really the administration. And, you know, we, we could argue about the extent to which the independent agency was involved, should have been involved in discussions, but there were very significant discussions very early on about how to unleash investment in competitive facilities. Uh, competition, I think, is the way Jim thought about it. And I would argue that um, it was really, while Reed was certainly a major player in that, Al Gore believed in it and Bingaman believed in it. There were a lot of people uh, in the administration and a lot of people in Congress who who believed in it, and um, a lot of things, there was a lot of strategy uh, that was developed to that, such that when the act actually passed, you know, we got done in six months, the no proposed rulemaking, you can argue about the merits or demerits of it, but we got it done in a very timely manner, it went to the court, a lot of things went to the court, but there, it was really that commitment to competition on an administration-wide level, it was not a single person, um, and it was really about can we unleash comp uh, investment to do it. The only other thing I would note um, was that at the time, I think our fear was that even with rules written in certain ways, it was very unlikely that investment would really drive a great deal there. And uh, it's interesting how history kind of in some ways criticizes us because there was way too much investment uh, from some perspectives in the CELEC such that some of the critics of Reed um, suggest essentially that somehow Reed convinced John Malone to invest in 360 networks. Anyone who remembers the relationship between Reed and John Malone, 
he famously was on the actually, cover of actually, Wired magazine. Look closer to home in our next keynote presentation. John Malone's investment in ICG is actually a little more. Well, that, or, or that, right, right. But, but, but my point is, the, the notion, as we were sitting there in 95, thinking about it in the 96 and implementing it, the notion that there would be this essentially overinvestment did not really seem like a realistic possibility. And it's just an, you know, it's an object lesson, and there are many different variables that affect how things actually play out. Well, one of, one of the reasons this conference is timely is we've now had more time between 82, when the um, breakup was agreed upon, until 96, then from 96 till today. Chris, you've got this perspective of having watched that period. The question I have for you, and feel free to add whatever you want, is at what point during this time period do you see this consensus emerge around competition? Because in 82, we had lots of states, with few exceptions like the ones you mentioned, saying, what the hell are you doing breaking up the phone company to this consensus that we need more, even more competition, we're going to open up the local loop even further. So how does that process play out, and what are, again, some key points along the way? Well, it, it, I, I now understand why I'm on this panel, which people who know me will be surprised. I'm here because I'm the representative of a monopolist. Because, <laughs> no, because from 85 to 93, my job was at Bell Atlantic, right? I was protecting the interests of Bell Atlantic as against all these competitive inroads. So I got to tell you, from the monopolist perspective at that time, we saw the inroads of competition very early on. It was, it was obvious to us that we were under attack. And uh, let me give a couple of, but, but, then we tried, but then we tried to spin it in our direction. Let me tell you how we did that. We began to see it very early in the intralata competition proceedings in various states. And I'm remembering one that I think was 86, maybe late 85, in the state of Virginia, Commonwealth of Virginia, which remained a monopoly preserve until 95. They did not authorize local or intralata competition until 95. AT&T, bless their hearts, had a service called the Software Defined Network. Where they would have a where they have a special access pipe into a big cup company and a series of them, and we said that's great, but what about intralata and local calls? They said, well, we didn't take the trouble to program our switches to block those calls, so yeah, we can do intralata and local calls. We're sorry, we just you know we just designed our service that way. We call that mega comma. Yeah, that, that's right. Yeah, mega. And, and then so, so there's all this stuff going on. Where, sorry, excuse yeah, me. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> The analogy I use in a case is if, if someone says, the car I bought doesn't go slower than 70. You can't give me a speeding ticket. <laughs> we said, well, actually, we can't. But we, we could tell from the beginning that whoever the geniuses were who were designing AT&T's competitive products weren't taking the restriction on local and intralata uh, monopoly rights in any way seriously. That was a problem. Um, on the other hand, we sort of trying to make a you know, silk purse out of a sow's ear or whatever it is, said, well, if we're going to be subject to competition, then we shouldn't be regulated. And the very first alt-reg case that you're talking about in 93, the very first one actually took place in 85, or excuse me, 86 in West Virginia, and I, I, I did that one for the company. Our pitch at the time was, look at all these forces arrayed against us, you know, the massive AT&T, the IBMs, the blah, blah, blah. Why are you keeping us restricted? And so our, our first step was to get out of rate of return regulation, which was critical because we were investing like crazy and you didn't want to be rate of return regulated when the depreciation hit in. Uh, were the movies to price caps at this point? Price yeah, moving to price caps. caps. Well, first was intrastate. We did intrastate price caps starting in 86, and then interstate was 89. We started in 89 and got it in 91 or 92. But that, that regulatory relief for the monopolist, the, the pitch for that was, we are under competitive assault, and we can't possibly be expected to stay regulated. The most public version of that occurred in 87, and that was the triennial review report that uh, Peter Huber put together. That report was a complete reversal, and it's fundamentally a repudiation of Baxter's idea that it was a natural monopoly, right? That report was all about fiber being built to places and the network being clever and being able to work around. And because there was no real natural monopoly, there was no need to have either the information services restriction or the equipment restriction, certainly, uh, on the bells. And Harold Green hated that. We had to go to the Court of Appeals to get it fixed. So for those uh, students of history, I think he called it the geodesic network. The geodesic network. And I have a copy of that still on my shelf. It's and it was the basis uh, for lifting the information services restriction on the Bell companies. And then there was, I think, like you said, uh, equipment, but long distance stayed. Yeah, long distance stayed. Um, Dale, I have to give you a right of reply. Even to mention the report, you were shaking your head at the time. This gets back to Jim's point about how much competition but, really but, was but, there. But, but, but let, let the record it? reflect that the, the seven, then seven Arbox 
had a very had a massive lobbying team whose sole job was to get Peter Huber everything he wanted or might want to build the case that the local markets were becoming insanely competitive. So that uh, was our story, and we were sticking to it. <laughs> well, well, I, I'll just say, Peter Huber, I think, was a, wrote the wrote the report, if I remember. Yes, right. that's right. Yeah. And uh, but the report was actually you look at what's happened today, and he was right, except for one one thing. He, you know, once you get by the local access network, then you can go lots of different directions, do lots of different things, reconfigure things. But but what he sort of conveniently minimized was the fact, how do I get to that network? And that, that's, that, that was where the economies of scale are in that first mile that made it very, very difficult to actually get there so you could do the sort of things he, he was talking about. So that, that was my major criticism of it. What the network becomes, and Jim's already adverted to this, is the internet, yeah. which is uh, a very different kind of network than the legacy network. Jim, you had the foresight to buy UUNet at MFS, so at some point you realized the internet was going to be a big deal. UUNet was at that point the largest internet backbone provider. At what point during your building of MFS did you get a sense that the internet had the sort of potential that, or even some of the potential that we've seen to use um, fiber optic uh, cable and capacity? Uh, yeah, we actually had an epiphany. Dan, I, do you remember there was a uh, report that we used to point to that had the cost to move a document by FedEx, the cost to fax a document. Who was the, doesn't matter who they were, but uh, we woke up one day and realized that to move a megabit or a pickier unit of measure uh, of information physically or over the telephone network was one to two orders of magnitude more expensive than it was to move that same piece of in, amount of information over an IP network. And this was an IP network built out of dial-up circuits at the time. Uh, you can imagine uh, what an eye-opener it was. And to cut a longer story short, we wrote a check for two billion bucks for a company with 90 million of trailing 12 months uh, revenue called UUNAC. Uh, I would also, just to broaden out the, the point, say that the internet operates up here. You still need to connect in one fashion or another. And to Dale's point, effective competition in the last 200 feet is still a giant experiment with a very limited number of companies who've invested capital and gotten a return, or maybe even you would say it's speculative. All of those companies that went bankrupt called Selex were generally the so-called smart Selex who resold that last thousand feet from the bells and just built the rest of the stuff because you could do that much more quickly. The hard part is to convince capital that has lots of choices on where they want to put their money, that they can actually get a return in a network business where you've got to build into a building and you've got to have enough connections to other places to have a network. Uh, I want to make just one pitch to everyone in here, which I'm, this is my latest pitch to anyone who will listen. So far, we've only managed to get effective competition on a broad basis. And, you know, I, I like to, I'll talk about level three, Dan can talk about Zao, but we're still very small on the cosmic scale of things. The effective com competition to date is cable, which is built with protected capital, uh, granted a, a, a governmental monopoly for a period of time. That's how it got started. Uh, we made a big mistake in, off, in, in granting the uh, the current alternative to the two wire lines, wireless access, in effect granting it to the monopolies at a price far below its true value. There's a giant opportunity right now to correct that mistake and actually have competition. There's a report in front of the president uh, suggesting that a thousand megahertz of government-owned spectrum be made available for shared purposes, sort of Wi-Fi on steroids, government retains ownership, uh, all those 
mammals on the west coast who invent at a pace that makes the telephone industry look like dinosaurs, turn them loose, and maybe we have a shot at a third effective competitive alternative. We kind of blew it with wireless to start with. And so far, the effective competition has all been granted monopolies. I don't mean to say, so Dan won't curse me when he gets up here, you can't build a fine business competing with the monopolies. You can. But as citizens looking for competition, it's going to take a long, long, long time if you simply keep going the way we're going. So, Roger, in terms of the Internet as a, like, uh, Jim and Dale put it, uh, a platform or um, a uh, basis for people to start using lots and lots of data and capacity. Um, when does that start to kick in and how does that drive the demand as part of the story and lead to it, what again Blair referred to, the overinvestment that happens in the irrational exuberance? When does that story ever get to break through? Well, the, the it's, it's really fascinating. I was on a National Academy committee in the early 1980s when we got to use DARPANET. And uh, everybody on that committee knew what was going to happen, but nobody else did. <laughs> it was such a, to me it was always an intriguing thing in the, in the late 80s and early 90s to view the disconnect between the policy discussion, which um, minimized the importance of the Internet, and minimize the importance of wireless as a device to connect to the internet versus where all the bright guys were putting their brain cells. So uh, it seems to me that if you were a really smart person with some technical savvy, you should have figured it out by the, by the late 1980s. But uh, it doesn't appear that the, that the larger universe figured it out for quite a while longer. Um, and indeed, had they figured it out, I, I agree with you that the wireless uh, uh, has not evolved in the optimal way, but still it's evolved a hell of a lot better than it would have evolved if everybody had known in 1985 that it was going to become a mechanism for extensive use of the internet. Uh, then we would we would have been stuck with a wireless monopoly or the duopoly. The original idea in the 1980s was the local exchange carrier gets one and somebody else gets the other one. That would have been the world we would have been lived in. We would have lived in had people not figured had figured it out, and we hadn't gotten the uh, the the change in spectrum allocation that we got in the 1990s to to make it more competitive. So I, I think that you know. Uh, my hope for the future, I think, is consistent with Jim's. My expectation is that we're going to allocate much more spectrum to wireless, that we're going to make it structurally competitive, uh, structurally competitive as economists see it, which isn't a thousand firms, it's five, uh, nationwide, uh, high quality uh, wireless access firms, and that that will make, in fact, the access to the internet competitive, but it's and, and at high quality, but we're not there yet, and it's we're in a good shit place to be there, but we're not there yet. Blair? I just add a couple of quick things. Uh, two of the most underappreciated decisions, I think, uh, were how we treated access charges, continuing um, not applying access charges to the Internet, uh, not controversial. Well, actually, it was controversial in the sense that the phone companies <laughs> came to us and said, you know, if, if this is really going to be a big thing, uh, you need to allow us to charge it, and Reed said no. Mm -hmm. uh, as Jim suggested, he was he didn't take a lot of time to do that, or and, and he was very clear about it. The one that didn't get publicity, but I think actually in some ways was was even was was just as significant was reducing the terminating access charge that Wired charged wireless, and that really that in combination with the auctions, which led to more, multiple competitors, led to wireless going from being kind of a luxury product to a, a mass market product. Um, I. I, I do agree that uh, wireless holds terrific potential. I would just note, uh, and this has been the, kind of the basis of the work I did in the broadband plan, I don't think we're going to recover enough spectrum on an exclusive basis to change market structure or to cause a great deal more competition. I could be wrong about that, but I think that fundamentally what the incentive auctions will end up doing, and I'm being an analyst here, is lowering the, the cost structure for the industry which I think is really important, 
but I don't believe that in most places it will be sufficient either to have significantly more competition on wireless or enable wireless broadband to compete with wired broadband. So and I think a, that we that's a uh, uh, disagree. more than ninety percent of wireless bits today are Wi-Fi. Right. By far, I mean, look at the number of devices people in this room buy that are Wi-Fi only. And I'd add to the significant decisions the FCC made is to take some junk spectrum that no one wanted and say, let's just run an experiment and see what entrepreneurs backed by risk capital might do. No one worries about whether there's three licensed Wi-Fi providers or 10,000. Uh, point one. Point two, I will make a prediction. I think I'll be dead before I have to worry about it. The greatest Trojan horse of our time is when the cellular, uh, the uh, current duopoly allowed Wi-Fi radios to get built into every smartphone. Uh, that is the great Trojan horse. So but in which I, direction? Uh, for, for them or against them? Uh, your kids buy Apple. They don't buy Verizon. Well, but I, I would make the observation that Wi-Fi is really interesting in that it A is the only way AT&T and Verizon can essentially offer the service they're offering they're today. They're building the industry but it also that's creates... going to take business away from them. Right, exactly. That, that's my point. It's, it works in both directions. You don't need but... to clear spectrum. Take 1,000 megahertz, let the Department of Defense keep their shore radar and have the right to bump it. Anybody that wants, and I, I, say, I want to defer my answer to Craig Moffat but, but later the, the, uh, because the, he's the, actually the, written about this. The, pro the, pro the problem is, though, you're not going to go very far collecting lots of bandwidth from all these Wi Fi points, so you're going to have to be on your network, Jim. I mean, you're going to have to hit fiber pretty darn quick, in, in, in my opinion. So, fortunately gonna, for me, there's a whole okay, report we're getting, written I'm sorry, we're getting a, by a this. presidential advisory committee on this topic that I will, a lot smarter people than I am. And, that yeah. is directly on this point, how you do it. And fortunately for um, those of you who came from D.C., our next event on Spectrum is in D.C. Those of you who aren't can watch it, we will pick up some of these themes. Is that a general way of saying stay on topic? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Sorry about that, Bill. I want to get back to the uncomfortable question that I think Bob was thinking while he's listening to Roger talk, which is really the high-stakes question that was painful at the time when I started tuning in. It's painful in respect. How did AT&T so blow it, is what Roger said. The two waves of the future was going to be wireless. The old AT&T. The old AT&T, right. Wireless, and it was going to be the internet. Yes. AT&T WorldNet at one point was bigger than AOL. They spun off for a bucket of porridge their licenses to the Bells at the press conference, yeah, and they, they said, who they gets it? That in. I mean, they, they, they said, was, yeah. the Bells can have it. It's yeah. not worth anything. This gets back to Rogers. They bought it back from Craig McCaw, only to spin it off later. So, <laughs> I mean, how, seriously, how did AT&T miss the two biggest drivers, both of which obviously relate to the ultimate internet, but, but wireless, mobility, and... and given that about 25% of the people who saw it coming were employed by AT&T at Bell Labs. <laughs> yeah. 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 You know, I can't argue with history. Like but Dave I mean, Eisenberg? <laughs> when we did the divestiture, you know, they, we had done studies and concluded that, that wireless was going to be no more than a luxury product. I think uh, Jim described that earlier. I think that's, that's the history. Um, they, they bought McCaw in 1993, right when I joined the company, is, uh, is when they bought McCaw. And, and, and Dave Dorman, to this day, will tell you that the hardest decision that he ever had to make after he took over from Armstrong was spinning the wireless unit off, but he, he had to do it in order to load it with some of the debt that we had acquired in doing the Media One transaction and in upgrading the TCI plant, you know, because Armstrong came in and his vision was we don't have a last mile. We got to have a last mile. And he didn't see that wireless you know, could be, that. could be that. I mean, we had the Angel Spectrum. You remember the Angel Spectrum? It's the WCS Spectrum that is currently up at the FCC right now. And, you know, we had the pizza box on the side of the house that we were going to do. And, uh, and, and Armstrong became convinced that that technology wasn't going to be there fast enough and he needed a last mile and that we had squandered whatever lead that we had had and he felt that he had to act very quickly. Uh, he overpaid for TCI. He under um, uh, under due diligence the deal to understand what the cost of upgrading that plant was going to be. 
Uh, and when Dave came in, um, Dave will tell you today, that was, the, that was the one thing he never wanted to do, but given the economics of where the company was at that point in time, he had no choice but to spin it off. So I, uh, I, I tell you, you know, it was, it, was, it was a vision. You remember what happened after, after Armstrong made the move to buy the cable broadband plant or to buy the cable plant to upgrade it to broadband. Um, that was right at the same time that Dan Hesse was introducing one rate. And, um, you know, Blair talked a little while about the different access rates that that structure enabled the one rate plan. And Hesse was running our wireless division at the time. And that completely, we had, we had that and the MCI fraud happening simultaneously, or the WorldCom fraud happening simultaneously, that it just cratered the economics. And, and when Dorman took over, you know, Dave will tell you that he, that was the hardest decision that he had to make, but he felt that that was the only decision that he could make, and it was the opportunity to be able to spin it off and pack it with a lot of the debt from the broadband entity, actually, um, in order to keep the company alive. Chris? So, you know, this group is probably one of the more technological determinist people, set of people you can find, right? That, that you know, we're here because you say, well, there's this cool technology, that cool technology is going to have to happen. And it's easy to see this is going to have to happen. And it does happen eventually one way or another. But I think that what we're missing in this conversation in answer to your question is shifting from, you know, technology school to business school. Corporate culture matters, right? And built into the DNA of a company like AT&T, even the divested AT&T, and built into the comp DNA of companies like Bell Atlantic that I worked for, was being a slow, careful monopolist. Mm -hmm. And when you have 100 years of history of being a slow, careful monopolist, you can have the coolest opportunity in the world right in front of you. And you say, well, I'm a cool monopolist. You know, I, I, if, if, it, if there's no guarantee of $100 million of revenue after three years, why should I bother? Right? I've heard that internally. And then there's the, well, but it might not work. We might spend you know, $500 million or a billion dollars get nothing for it, and then I don't get my next promotion. But usually what drives that is the, is the fear that you're going to cannibalize your existing business too quickly. Well, well, and the irony of it is that Hesse did something really aggressive but, but, with but, one rate, and he did exactly the thing that we usually were so careful not to do, but it's which not, was we cannibalize the business almost overnight on the LD side. It's not just cannibalization. A cannibalization yeah, no, is it, a reason, but there's just, there's just a way, I mean, going, having gone from, you know, Bell Atlantic to representing cable operators, representing ISPs, and you know, I, I've seen the difference in just the way people think about what an opportunity is in a business are different depending on where you come from. I mean, there's a human factor here and a cultural factor here that seems to over, it doesn't override the technology society-wide, but it very much affects who takes advantage of the opportunities that are out there. You happen to have just given the best argument that economists can come up with for why you want competition and free entry. It's pre oh, right. pre precisely that phenomenon is that every company has its way of looking at the world and it's going to try to solve the same problem in a different way and there'll be a hundred of them out there and four or five will be right and all the rest will be wrong. And there's no way to avoid it. That's the nature of fundamental uncertainty or about technological progress. Central planning yeah. It yeah, only that's... works when you have no other choice. Right. The, in, in communications where two or three hundred billion to wire up a population in a, in a, in a, in a, in a, in a nation is a starter uh, investment. We've, we've convinced ourselves that uh, central planning is necessary and that there's still some truth in that. But as a generality, the faster the pace of change, the more we need folks who allocate capital who are going to be wrong eight times out of ten. And the less we need to make an extreme example, a federal computing commission to plan out the future of tablets and smartphones. Like it or not, technology has come to communications. 30, 40 years ago, it was a utility business. Now the protocols, the technologies, the stuff you buy are developed by entrepreneurial companies, not by central planning. And by definition, big, slow-moving companies don't do well in that environment. They're, they're greenhouse plants. They're 
temperature and humidity controlled. And, <laughs> I mean, so I, the stock market, at least in the last 12 months, would disagree with you. Right? Uh, well, let, it's let me, good to have a dividend, but, but you, right. you've been in the market long enough to know you're not going to, what is it, 19 out of 20 companies who've created the most market cap have come out of the U.S. and most of them in, in uh, Silicon Valley. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it's true short term, but. Let me ask Blair the question that um, follows uh, nicely from what Bob and Chris had to say. Technological determinism in the perspective that Roger articulated about how big companies miss opportunities, you could say AT&T, um, the long distance company, was bound to fail. Or you could say different leadership, different choices, you know, had someone else been CEO, say Bob Allen and Mike Armstrong were not CEO, but you had Steve Jobs you know, or the Steve Jobs of telecom yeah. starting uh, 1993. Mm -hmm. Could AT&T have survived as a significant mm -hmm. player in a internet-enabled environment, or given its legacy and the fact that it was sitting on this dying long-distance base, it was doomed to fail? I'll, I'll give you a different question, though. Oh. What, what if Armstrong had gotten there three years earlier? It would have been great. Right? No, I, I think Armstrong actually, had a vision. Right. I mean, and he would have bought at a cheaper price. He would have and, bought at a cheaper price, yeah. right? No, look, I. Uh, you can write the history in many ways, and I kind of facetiously said, you know, it's nice of you to allow me to criticize um, prior FCCs. And I don't want to criticize an individual, but I do think that one of the untold stories of the 96 Act was the relative length of time different CEOs thought about how long they would be there. Bob Allen knew he was on his way out. Ivan Seidenberg was on the, in, and Ed Whitaker were about to create their legacy. So the difference in how you know, and this obviously is not criticism of the lobbyists, but the whole strategy that Bob Allen had seemed to us to be about his exit, which, you know, was kind of, you know, I agree if Armstrong had gotten there earlier. Armstrong had a vision. I mean, yeah. I, it, it didn't, it, he didn't execute it well, but time kind of worked against him too. Well, look, if you had, if, if you, you had made the right investment in cable at the right time and bought at the right time, right. Uh, obviously the, that, that cable plant uh, I, I think most people w would agree, is a superior plant today, is dominant in the broadband market, which is the most critical market, and likely to remain so for some on the wired side for as far as the eye can see. So but that Armstrong would have required was Armstrong to say, I'm going to be happy to be in the transport business, which is about 5% of my revenue today. Mm -hmm. The other 95 I'll forget about. Give me 20 years and it'll come back up again. Yeah. It's just awfully hard. Uh, I mean, there's books written about all of this topic. Innovator's it, Dilemma. Oh, Innovator's Dilemma. It's yeah. just, That's right. I mean, IBM, it isn't that they didn't get that the PC was a big deal, right? right. Uh, it isn't that AT&T didn't realize packet switching was a big deal. They developed ATM. A lot of what we call the Internet came out of Bell Labs. I mean, there were a lot of smart people. It's just the physics of it. So we have a lot of smart people in the audience starting with a number of our students, and per our general rule, I'd like to give them a chance at the first question. Being a professor, I'm not afraid to call on folks if no one volunteers. So, uh, <laughs> questions from the audience, from students. Yeah, Ian. So let me situate it in the historical context. There could have come a time where the US government, looking at the Bell monopoly, would say, listen, we're going to have one fiber network that's going to be um, to the home and throughout. Is there like, that sort of case that now, I guess, Australia is trying to do later? Um, or is the better policy the one that I guess Jim has adverted to, which is you can have at least two strong competitors to hold the home with wireless as a third. Um, a number of you have debated this topic in different contexts, so many of you have an answer. I suspect, Chris, what's your take? Yeah, in, in my role on this panel is defending the monopoly. Let me take a stab at defending <laughs> what Australia is doing. Uh, not, and, and I think, am I, I'm the only private lawyer. Just any of you who know my clients, don't, don't assume anything I say is any of their views. They don't know. They disagree with each other, so whatever. But the government is pretty good at doing things that are very stable and low technology. I mean, we don't have private competition for roads. Right, we don't have private competition for sewer plant or water plant. 
Now, as things change a little bit, it's interesting. Electricity, well, you know, you've got LA Department of Water and Power and the Tennessee Valley Authority, but you've got a lot of investor owned. And so you can sort of imagine a spectrum of, of things where you don't want the government in charge of designing the next chip or the next Facebook, but there's no problem with the government doing roads. And so the question is, at a high level, is data transport over fiber close enough to being a stable technology, uninteresting, boring, that you can have the Department of Fiber Transmission along with the Department of Traffic Lights? I don't actually think we're there yet. Um, if you ask me, you know, where will we be in 50 years? Could I see it? I, I, I could see it. So my, my, my suspicion is Australia is a little bit too ahead of the curve. But the logic of what they're doing is they're saying it's more like a road than it's like a computer. Singapore's done it. I just got back from Singapore. By the way, anybody who says it's a small world hadn't flown from Denver to Singapore. <laughs> <laughs> they have exactly what you're talking about. Yeah, but shooting. if you spit on the sidewalk in Singapore, they shoot you. I mean, imagine it's a place you want to They decided live. they were getting a bad rep, so they passed a law that said they're going to have more fun and you can spit more on them. So <laughs> literally. <laughs> But uh, it, it, look up photonic crystal fiber on your favorite search engine. Um, fiber is a technology, and you've got to be pretty careful. Uh, Dan, you remember the Iowa? Oh, yeah. Now, well, we built a fiber oh, network for the state of Iowa that connected everywhere. Yeah. Turned out, while the fiber had a pretty good life, the terminal equipment lasted three years and, and, and the state couldn't deal with it. So I just suggest to you, think about conduit everywhere. Uh, uh, you know, New York has such a thing. Uh, Empire City yeah. owns conduit everywhere in New York. You want to get into the business of offering fiber, you go to them and you can get conduit anywhere. If they don't have it, they build it. Fiber is pretty risky. You know, I, I'll tell you, I, I, I just break it down. I, I remember, um, I haven't looked at what's going on in Australia in, in a, a, about six or seven months. But the bill to build out Australia was over $50 billion. I think if you had to replicate that in the United States, we'd be talking about a half a trillion dollars of public money. It's, it's a lot more complicated as well. They bought out Telstra which was the local local company in, in, in this country, that would mean buying out all of the cable companies, all of the telcos, all of the Celex. I, I just don't, I don't think there's a feasible, possible chance that that could ever, that we, we have the money in this country to do that. I think we've, we've crossed that Rubicon already. It's, 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 you know, we're just not gonna get there. We, we probably, made that decision back in 1983 is one of the, you know, one of the kind of unforeseen consequences of breaking up the bell system, which, you know, maybe it might have worked. And some might argue that we crossed that, we crossed that threshold back in 69 as soon as, as soon as MCI was kind of allowed to survive. We, we may have kind of passed the opportunity to ever do that. But I just don't see us as a country taking that kind of a project on today. Roger. Right. I think Australia is essentially useless as an example. I mean, what Australia has is a long history of, first of all, being extremely accommodating to Telstra. Uh, and then they didn't, when they finally decided it wasn't going to work, they didn't give up the notion of a Telstra. They just put a government name tag on it. And you can, you know, you, you, I think someone, I think it was you, Jim, made the statement that if you design, on paper, as an engineering design problem, it really looks great to build a single humming system, all right? Because it's all interconnected and there's all these economies of scale you can take advantage of. But then you have to remember what we just talked about, which is that individuals make mistakes, they get things wrong, technology takes unanticipated turns. Uh, and when you th think it, when you're dealing with information technology, which is the most rapidly evolving technology in the history of mankind, uh, it doesn't make any sense at all to adopt the monopoly, the pure monopoly model, because in, in the long run, it'll bite you that you don't have diversity 
uh, in a world of great uncertainty and rapid change. I mean, and, you know, when I, when I think about it, you, to do something like that, you would have to have a, a real long-term vision. And I haven't heard anybody describe the Washington political scene as being immersed in long-term vision. These are different points, but they're, they're, they both go to your point. I mean, your point is it'll never happen. I mean, even if it was a great, even if it was a great idea, it would never happen. But your point is it's not even that great an idea. Yeah. Yeah. Probably and the only <laughs> thing everybody at the table is going to be agreeing <laughs> about. I mean, when you're in an industry where average asset lives are shrinking, visibly shrinking, you can't turn that over uh, to government. They're just terrible at anything where average asset lives get shorter. So you're always looking backwards and never forwards. And boy, are we in that kind of a business. I, I would just add very quickly, we actually looked at this in the National Broadband Plan. A lot of people suggested we use something like Australia. I think we had an analysis that was very similar to what Bob said. Yeah. But we looked at a bunch of different countries, and it turns out, boy, the United States just really is, I'm not going to do a big American exceptionalism, but the presence of cable and the, the, the background of things like what Jim is doing, there's so many differences. Actually, there's no real good country, there's no country that gives us a good model, and we're just going to have to keep inventing new models ourselves. I keep one remembering that no one's come up with a reason to use the internet outside the U.S. All the reasons why you want a smartphone or a tablet or Except internet for Skype. connection. Except maybe Skype. Skype was invented outside the U.S. The exception that makes the rule. You're yeah, exactly, exactly right. right. And yeah. a good customer, so I should have never been <laughs> 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 well, actually, actually, almost, almost, almost everyone. Well, I think almost are, most are, most are governments are outside, outside the, the U.S. want to use so, the internet for yeah. surveillance. Yeah. Right, right, right. <laughs> Surveillance and thought control, isn't yeah. it? All right, so other questions from the audience other than students? Oh, we got another student. Yeah. Yes. Um, so part of the discussion, you talked about Let me repeat the question, let Dale go first, because he literally whispered that to me as a point that was worth <laughs> making. Question is, what has or did government do that can, let's say, lower entry barriers, and what should government do, whether or not they have, to lower entry barriers into um, this marketplace? Well, there's, there's things like pole attachments, of course. Nobody talked about duplicating pole lines, so pole attachments becomes a becomes an issue. Uh, access to ducks, doing the sort of things, making it easy to tear up the roads and put in ducks, or encouraging people to share the ducks. I think those are all positive. Uh, and of course, I have to confess, being in, also in the antenna business, that uh, you know, doing things to make the zoning uh, process uh, uh, efficient. Because if we're going to do all this wireless, you got to you got to get through the zoning process. Look at Kansas can... City. I mean, Kansas City is a great example. They want to Google. And, and, and in, did you see the process they created for... Uh, well, I, I, we actually have Milo here, so we have to give him the... <laughs> we know a lot about Kansas City. My, Milo, what have you learned from Kansas City about this question about enabling entry? Do you have a mic for Milo or no? You want to borrow a mic? All right, speak. Come uh, up. Speak, speak loud. I, well, I was raised on a farm in the Central Valley, so I think it's, it's not too bad. I think one of the advantages that we have is we don't have to build anywhere. Uh, and so what that means is you can go to the place where uh, it's easier to build. And um, a lot of times communities don't understand the restrictions that they put on construction because oftentimes incumbents are doing only incremental builds. And so, you know, that's fine. Their arrangements work for incumbents, but they don't work for new entry. And so by going through the process of understanding where all the cost is, uh, and then working with the city to say, can we optimize, mm -hmm. right? Um, they were able to collaborate with us to make their government functions much more efficient. And um, because I think they really have, nobody really thought that through from their perspective before. I compare and contrast that with what Verizon went through 
on municipality by municipality to try and do files, which is something that the community should have seen is a is, is something they desire just as much. And and what Verizon went through is just a different mindset of the community. The community in Kansas City wanted you guys. The community and and you know all of the communities Verizon dealt with were like you know what can we extract out but of this process? Part of that is I think you have to have a differentiated product. For, for lack of a better issue, people in many communities did not consider Fios from a pricing or performance perspective that much different than what could be delivered from the cable operators. And that's a real problem. So I, I, think I, I, I think part of it is Google created a sense that communities were going to get something special, where Verizon said, we're doing this whole area, and the people who knew, lived in those areas said, oh, we can take it for granted, and the government's we're a little bit more, oh, good, we get to kind of put a toll on this. Hey, Milo, you're in an almost unique position to answer the following question. Having been in startups all the way to somebody with $50 billion of cash in the bank, what do you think the odds of ABC startup going into Kansas City and accomplishing what you've accomplished are? I think uh, when you look at the current rules for poll attachment, for... Um, for a number of, of, of issues in terms of permitting, regulatory, et cetera, it's very, very difficult for a small company to do that. Well, you it guys doesn't have to be, but it is the way it is today. Well, and, and you can say communities get together and tell us you want us, right? I mean, Okay, can I just add that I'm actually working on this with the Gig.U project, and we're doing a number of different, we're working with a number of different communities. It turns out there's actually a formula, and it is the relationship between CapEx and OpEx. If you're an incumbent, it's incremental. If you're a new entrant, it's new. Uh, the relation between that and risk-adjusted revenues plus system benefits plus threat of competitive losses. And what's interesting is what the, if you look at the agreement, the 25-page agreement that Google struck, they do a number of things that dramatically reduce CapEx, op OpEx, risk, a little bit of, up, of revenue. But if you also, if you look at every single upgrade we've had, there was a change in that formula preceded by public policy that made it possible to upgrade the cable network, that made it possible to upgrade the wireless network. Every single one, it always follows the same formula. We are working with a number of different local communities to try to figure out how in their, what, you know, the city of Seattle is doing something that's very different than what the city of Chicago is doing, which is different than what Orono, Maine is doing, but it always follows that formula. And so, Alex, the answer to your question is, you know, the build, the dig once, which, you know, the president signed, that's a good thing, but it's, you have to do a bunch of things to actually get the error to switch from CapEx, OpEx greater than to CapEx, OpEx less than. But to specifically answer your question, things are kind of orthogonal to traditional telecom regulation. I, I would say there are a couple of things that have intrigued me as, as legal or regulatory tweaks that could actually affect this. One would be building codes, particularly commercial building codes. And I would say somebody should, you know, whoever does building codes, I don't know, the building code should say, and your cable vault will be big enough to do X, and it will have a conduit out to the street. Exactly. And just say, you can't build a new commercial building that doesn't have that, because it just wouldn't be code. Similarly, you will build a roof with adequate structure to support you know, yes. antenna of various sorts. Mm -hmm. And you just can't build a building because it won't be code if you can't do that. That's not telecom regulation. And it's the kind of thing, that's when you want to do it. And maybe the bit, maybe it'll sit there for five years before someone uses it, but then it's there. So that's one. Two, going back to my Monopoly days, back when I was at, at, at Bell Atlantic, we had the problem of people who were in our service area. We weren't a big receiver of local, uh, of USF money. We were a payer. But people who nonetheless, their house was a mile down some private road. And the way we worked it out, there's a bizarre thing in, in utility doctrine called contributions in aid of construction, right? Which means if an individual wants to give money to the phone companies back in the old days to pay for the phone company to build that, it becomes part of the phone company rate base and, and it all worked out. I would submit that if we could change the mortgage rules so that when you buy a house, you could build in another couple three thousand dollars to pay for your fiber the fiber provider of your choice but to pay for up to five miles of fiber from your house to somewhere and build it into your mortgage then as houses turn over more and more direct fiber would be built so, why, to, so, so th those aren't telecom regulatory things but if we did them 
it would it would seed the the ground for further growth. So. Um, Brad Bernthal is here in the back, has for years taught our technology law and policy clinic. I think you all, uh, provoked by Alex's question, have come up with some great ideas for students in that clinic um, in terms of things we can do and things we learn from Kansas City. Uh, one last question from a non-student that uh, folks may have. Uh, yes, Marvin, go ahead. Uh, we heard uh, uh, Jim Crow that they built this uh, system for Iowa and Fiber was still useful. What do you think of the model of Stock Ave in Stockholm, where they have built dark fiber everywhere, but they don't spend a dime on electronics? All that is done by the lessees of the strands. Let me give a, a related question, uh, which is how much fiber got built during the last 25 years that we're not quite sure how effectively it's being used or even if we know where it is. <laughs> Which is something that I heard a lot about US West having. I don't know how true that is. And then secondly, to broaden Marvin's question, what models of fiber management are more effective to enable to be used? Because I, I do get the sense a lot of fiber got built and was not fully effectively used. Getting back, that's one example. Connecting directly to customers, zero was overbuilt. Okay. Connecting to others who connected to customers, a lot got overbuilt. Is all the stuff that got overbuilt potentially going to get used somehow, some way, somewhere, or some of it's going to get mothballed and never get used? Markets answering the question. Look at the multiples commanded by people who connect directly to buildings or customers. Look at those who made it, uh, TW Telecom to their credit, made it right through the collapse of the tech bubble, right through the collapse of the financial credit, uh, because you're connected directly to customers. Those who tried to shortcut didn't make it. I, uh, another, another point is, is, I think it was, maybe everybody said, whether we want to build fiber as a utility or not, isn't an option. Uh, I mean, Verizon put 23 billion into Fios, had to quit. Uh, it's it's just not an option. Uh, it, uh, you, if you build it between cities, you're just duplicating what the market will do. If you tried to build it to the 3.5 million buildings that only serve business, forget consumer, you'd go. The, the country couldn't afford it. So it's. If I could just add that I, we we looked at the Stockholm model as well, and there were a lot of differences, and you know. Regulatory structure was obviously different. What, one thing I would just note, and Milo will perhaps speak about this later, is there's a question of to what extent can you simply have a wholesale model that doesn't depend on video revenues. And one of the things that obviously all of our members, the Gig you members, are interested in is, in watching is uh, Google's effectiveness in Kansas City with the both the gigabit product but also the traditional video product. And I think Milo, not speaking for him, would say you have to have a video offering. They don't in Stockholm. They've somehow made that work. But I don't know that in the U.S. context it, it could customers work. Customers of Stock have, have video options. Right, but the underlying wholesaler does not. Blair, what do you do if the video offering gets disconnected from transport, that well, over the top becomes real? Right, that's, that's the that's Stockholm question. has a model where they're trying to make work. Well. Stockholm, uh, YouTube Stockholm model. is less than <laughs> New York. I mean, it's, it's just not comparable. Well, Marvin will get his chance to talk more about the final panel. I want to thank this panel for a great discussion.